relationship between climate change, migration and conflict undoubtedly exists. However, it is neither deterministic nor linear. It is mostly about the localized interplay of climate stressors, weak coping capacity and above all, governance factors. Integrating a security perspective with climate change is fundamental in order to alleviate its destabilizing impacts. As climate change effects on peace and security are accumulative, they need a long-term lens, and this represents a challenge for governments and multilateral organizations. One thing is clear though, Europe needs migrants, but migrations need to be safe and orderly in order to avoid forced mass displacement, we must focus on preventive action, which combines climate action, development, and peace building. First, the developed countries must scale up their climate finance to assist the developing countries in addressing the effects of climate change to which they contributed the least. The EU has contributed more than a third of climate finance is committing, is committing to more. Second, we need to be smart about our development assistance. It must be based on a comprehensive but also context-specific approach. Integrated approach to climate risks calls for synergies, meaning it has to be cross-sectoral, multidisciplinary, ecosystem-based, gender-responsive and conflict-proofed. Ideally, Solutions should be demand-driven and locally owned, based on a thorough and comprehensive research and analysis of the local needs and context. They need to be devised and implemented together with the local communities, implemented in a way that improves resilience, human security, livelihoods and economic development, while fostering good intercommunal relations. Science is crucial for understanding the effects of climate change and for informing the decision-making process, including the environmental peace-building process. And citizen science must be its integral part. Climate change brings risks, yes, but we should also be aware of the opportunities that climate change action offers for fostering community cohesion and for conflict prevention, resolution and peace building. It can represent an excellent entry point for cooperation, particularly in fragile and transboundary contexts, where the political will to cooperate may be lacking. And finally, what role does art and culture in general play in this? Besides some obvious functions, it can also be of great help in changing perceptions and narratives that hinder cooperation or foment conflict. The interplay of politics, science and art in addressing climate change implications is an important one and we should explore its full potential. Hello, I'm Jeannie Sowers, at the, a professor at the University of New Hampshire, and I'm delighted to be on this panel today. I'm going to talk briefly about the intersections between environmental infrastructures, protracted conflicts, and climate vulnerabilities, with particular attention to the Middle East and North Africa. Environmental infrastructures are systems of providing and managing flows of water, energy, waste, and food that make places and landscapes habitable. These are dependent upon ecosystem functioning as well as human investment. By environment side, we mean forms of war and war making that damage and destroy environmental infrastructures. This may happen in acute conflicts, protracted conflicts, and forms of occupation. Water energy infrastructures in the Middle East and North Africa have several features that all together compound social vulnerabilities to climate change. Fossil fuel intensive systems and rentier economies combine with national security states to dampen civil society and activism and in hinder regional cooperation. Conflicts in the region are regionalized and internationalized, meaning they often go on longer than they would otherwise and involve a plethora of actors. The lack of cooperation at regional levels and intolerance for local initiatives mean that water, energy, and food issues are dealt with in an uncoordinated fashion. And this damp deepens social vulnerability to climate change. 
Conflict effects on infrastructures also derive from the type of infrastructures that are centralized, capital intensive, and extend for long distances to access often single points of energy or water. 60% of citizens in the Middle East and North Africa currently live in cities and urbanization is rapidly increasing and ongoing. If we look at Yemen, we can see the intersection between the targeting and damage to environmental infrastructures and resultant forms of hunger and disease, as well as displacement. In our work, we have shown how targeting of infrastructure has gone after water, transportation, health, energy, agriculture, and fishing sectors. We geolocate these to show the distribution of harm across especially urban centers. Infrastructure sectors targeted include most that frequently agriculture and fishing, but also energy installations, water and health. Damage to environmental infrastructures has also increased the spread of disease. As many of you know, Yemen saw the largest epidemic of cholera uh, starting in 2017 with ongoing cases of cholera and COVID cases, although uh, few are recorded, there are very dire estimates of the actual levels of infection and mortality because there's no adequate surveillance. And both cholera and COVID-19 spreads are linked to waterborne and infectious diseases from a lack of wash water and sanitation facilities and access. If we think about looking at Yemen's uh, experience with extreme climate events, we can see that between 1971 and 2012, the incidence of extreme climate events such as flash floods has steadily increased. And Yemen is not alone in suffering between the intersection of conflict and climate change. If we look at the top 30 fragile and conflict affected states, many of them are also extremely vulnerable to the effects of man-made climate change. So what can be done? This is a conference called the Cassandra Conference, but we also have to chart ways forward that actually offer some hope. International and regional powers could do a number of things. If we took more seriously the public health and environmental consequences of protracted conflicts, we would reevaluate interventions, support for proxy forces, and commitments for arms and logistics to parties in these conflicts. We would also reduce support for authoritarian regimes, recognizing that they breed instability. And we could confront militarization at home and the steady growth in military industrial complexes. Inter international and regional powers should also move forward with divesting from fossil fuels, which would, which would change the international political economy that sustains fossil fuel intensive regimes and elevate climate disaster risk reduction in aid budgets for conflict affected countries. MENA governments could actually move instead of hindering regional cooperation to supporting it on critical food, water and energy issues that affect their own stability as well as that of their populations. They could also foster diversified sources of local infrastructure and manage natural resources, allowing civil society to participate and pluralism at the local levels to uh, foster innovation and, and, diversity, and diversity. Lastly, they could focus on restoring and rehabilitating local ecosystems that would help ensure livelihoods and um, environmental sustainability for, sustainability for their populations. Thank you so much. This research has been supported by a number of institutions listed here, and I look forward to our discussion. My name is Gidon Bromberg, and I'm the Israeli co-director of EcoPeace Middle East. EcoPeace is a unique regional organization that brings together Palestinian, Jordanian, and Israeli environmentalists. While the rest of the world is fearful of a one and a half to two degree increase in temperatures, here in the Middle East, since the 1950s, we've already experienced a two degree increase in temperatures and the climate models are warning that we can expect somewhere between a four to seven degree additional increase in temperatures by the end of this century. The climate crisis represents the greatest threat to the very survival of people and the environment in the Middle East. The climate crisis could be 
a threat multiplier that would lead to further climate refugees, to extreme temperatures and floods and extended periods of drought that risk the very survival and uh, could lead to heightened competition, particularly over scarce water resources in our region. But at Ecopeace Middle East, we believe that the climate crisis could equally be an opportunity to advance cooperation and produce climate resilience. And for that reason, we launched a report calling for a green blue deal for the Middle East, a green blue deal that I'll, I will delve into that describes um, comparative advantages where Jordan through its vast desert areas can produce large scale renewable energy for her own needs, but also to meet climate mitigation targets in Israel and Palestine. And Israel and Palestine being on the Mediterranean coast can produce today manufactured water at scale that advances climate adaptation and meets the challenge of reduced uh, uh, water availability because of the climate crisis. But further, by creating healthy interdependencies, where for the first time, Palestinians and Israelis will have something to sell to Jordanians, and Jordanians have renewable energy to sell to Israelis and Palestinians, we can advance healthy interdependencies that can lead to stability and help us meet the challenge that the climate crisis presents. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for those uh, those very inspiring uh, videos and and letting us know a little bit more about uh, this idea of the the climate uh, crisis as well as uh, what we might see as potential areas of uh, of conflict. Now, I say potential areas of conflict because really uh, it's difficult for me to um, to put these two together: um, the idea of climate change and conflict and and the reason for that is uh well if if we have a little bit of an idea of uh, of conflicts globally uh, at the moment i've got a small list here of uh, some of the the major and minor wars that uh, have happened over these uh, over these last couple of years that have been ongoing for uh, for a number of years and the first ones on the list are, are the afghanistan conflict the mexican uh, drug war the yemeni crisis and the Tigray uh, wars, um, a lot of these, uh, obviously, issues that have been happening for many years, cultural divides, etc. Um, now we're talking about conflict and climate change. For me, uh, conflict is uh, is always uh, has always been there, and, and it's not necessarily invoked by climate change. Are we uh, really just trying to uh, make this a bigger story than what it is, to try and put it on the front page of, uh, of newspapers, to try and, because our voice seems to be lost a little bit in this idea of uh, our war on climate, right? Uh, so are we trying to push this to the top of the agenda by saying climate change is going to cause conflict? With that uh, in mind, um, I'd, I'd like to bring on uh, Johan, as we haven't uh, seen from uh, fr from your side uh, the um, your your input. So, how do you see this uh, idea of climate and conflict? Is it a reality? Well, I, I I agree with your I think your sort of healthy skepticism here. I think we need to be very careful in what we portray, and there is a, clearly a tendency to sort of dramatize or provide very speculative notions uh, uh, in, in terms of this potential link between uh, climate change and conflict. And I think things are serious enough as they are in terms of, of the scenarios and prospects that we now see unfolding and that, that are becoming increasingly sort of concrete and tangible for us. And I think that the, the perspective that Jeannie just uh, presented, um, what we do know is that ongoing existing conflicts now, uh, uh, if you look at the people involved and sort of trapped in these conflicts, the, these are the populations that are most uh, 
uh, most vulnerable uh, have the least resilience to also cope with the impacts of climate change. And I think that that's not something we need to speculate speculate about or sort of you know hypothesize about. This is a fact, and it's an often ignored fact. If you look at if you list uh, uh, countries in, according to their there's a, an ND gain index which combines climate readiness and climate vulnerability. And if you look at the uh, you know the, the rating of countries in that index, you find all the current uh, uh, countries in conflict are at the very bottom, both in terms of readiness and and, uh, uh, and vulnerability, including including some of the Middle East nations. So I think what we do know is that there are, are under certain conditions. Yes, we believe that uh, the impact of climate change can exas exacerbate and, and sort of further uh, uh, un undermine institutions and capacities and so on, and, and may make existing tensions and conflicts worse. But I don't think we should talk about the sort of direct causal link between climate change and conflict. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Jan, thank you uh, for that. Uh... For, for that idea, and, and, and you you brought on uh, uh, Jenny's uh, Jenny's sorry uh, um, ideas uh, within that, and, and some of the the bits that she was talking about. And in fact, Jenny, you, you mentioned in side. So now we're all of a sudden we're moving from this idea of uh, of conflict to to uh, to to really calling it uh, sort of well mixing with the words of genocide with uh, with environment, right? Could you? Tell us a little bit more about that uh, concept and, and how that comes about. Or oh, you're on mute, I think. Thank you. Um, yes, I wanted to introduce it because I think we often focus in, in many ways rightfully on the human impacts of conflict and climate change. But we really should also be talking about the environmental impacts of conflict and climate change. So we have these sort of vicious cycles between the degradation of the environment that's already in play in so many places, including the Middle East and North Africa. And then we have the effects of conflict on top of that on these environments. And so I want to bring in this thinking about not just the human impacts, but the environmental impacts, because of course they're completely linked in terms of increasing people's suffering and vulnerability. And so a good example, just since I mentioned Yemen, is flash floods. So many displaced persons in Yemen moved to the sort of floodplains and wadis, the lower levels of um, basically areas that are subject to flooding. And so they were subject to multiple displacements from conflict, but also from extreme weather events tied to climate change. So I really like Johan's formulation that in a way what we're looking at is the intersecting vulnerabilities that come about both from climate change and from conflict. Now, uh, Gideon, I'll, I'll bring you in here because uh, instead of talking about conflict, you're talking about stability. So, uh, so let's let's hear a little bit more about uh, that that concept, and especially stability in the Middle East, right? Uh, with uh, when we start to talk about uh, uh, threats, and uh, and obviously climate change is a, a threat multiplier, as you mentioned. So, uh, tell us a little bit more about this idea of uh, how how potentially we can start to move towards stability when we have a, a threat multiplier like climate change. Thank you for the question and for the opportunity to participate. Um, I, I first I want to paint a picture of, of how serious the situation is in my part of the world, um, where the reality is just so different from uh, many of the listeners, certainly if they're in, uh, uh, in Western Europe and North America. You know, people do not uh, receive water 24-7 in most towns, cities, villages throughout the Middle East and North Africa. There's an intermittent water supply. Um, I can tell you, uh, you know, in uh, Jordan's capital, Amman, uh, water uh, at the moment is being supplied for about eight hours a week. Um, there's a pipe and every house has a you know, tap to receive water, but there isn't sufficient water for the municipality to allow every neighborhood to have 24 seven water supply. Now, just two years ago, uh, the water supply was two days every week. And the Minister of Water in Jordan had declared at the beginning of the summer season 
that uh, most likely water supply was going to be cut to just uh, once every two weeks. And of course, there are areas of the region in the, in the West Bank, in the southern parts of uh, the West Bank, a, a major city, 100,000 people, Yatta, um, uh, gets water supplied in the summer in people's home, municipal water, once every two months. So the level of uh, water scarcity needs to be understood as how serious the situation presently is. And it's not clearly our present circumstances are not due just to climate change. They're a combination of conflict issues, of natural water scarcity, overpopulation, governance, economy, a whole set of factors. But things are just so brutal. The situation uh, is increasingly so severe that vulnerability levels are extremely high. And um, you know, oddly enough, um, uh, perhaps to some people, it might come as a surprise, this uh, 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 scenario you know, you know, uh, creates a, a level of desperation, an understanding that my very survival, my very future in my city, in my country, um, is increasingly at risk. And for governments, a growing sense that national stability, national security is at risk. And at the broader regional level, because climate change doesn't hit a particular country, it hits clearly the globe, but in a in a particular way, it hits a region. It hits the Middle East uh, as a climate hotspot, where, uh, as I said in the video, it hits us, it hits us harder than most other uh, places in the world and beyond you know, the average uh, globally. And therefore, in that scenario, um, with that understanding that uh, uh, the instability of inaction has not only national implications, but region-wide implications, then we can see how the climate crisis can be an impetus for further cooperation. It won't happen by itself. Levels of animosity here are high, but um, if we can uh, uh, you know, uh, present uh, facts, I mean, you know, one of the um, uh, one of the benefits that we have in our region, and perhaps is, is different from uh, uh, North America in particular, um, uh, climate denial is, is very low. The, the governments and the water experts of all of our countries are, are in complete agreement that climate change is real, it's already happening, and it's going to make a very serious situation far more serious. And it's, I think it's in that framework um, that we can build on um, uh, to promote uh, cooperation, not as a favor to someone else, but as an understanding that, that the cooperation cross-border to, uh, uh, to build climate resilience is critical to the national security of each one of the countries in our region and uh, of the uh, stability of the region as a whole. Thanks, Gideon. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great, great idea, great, uh, and, and the way we should think, really. Uh, but do you, do you think, and, I, and I'll come to you uh, uh, now, Tanya, uh, and, I, and, I have a, and I have a specific question related to that. I just want to uh, delve a little bit deeper into uh, what uh, Gideon was, was mentioning here. And if anybody would like to, uh, to add as well at any time, just uh, just by all means, uh, just jump right in. Um, but maybe uh, get on this. Um, what you mentioned is really like an utopian idea, right? Because uh, I mean, it's uh, for for us is what we want to get to, right? The, we're all in. The, we, we all have this understanding. We've uh, we've we've come through this e experience, and perhaps we're all in the same the same boat because we we understand where where we are, where we can end up going, etc. But when we start to uh, speak to um, 
to to everyday citizens and um, and we try to explain uh, the situation sometimes it can become a little bit uh, more challenging um there's some recent examples of um just just this last uh, week of uh, mexican farmers taking over control of one of the major dams uh, on the rio grande to uh, to to the states um and they've taken over control from the uh, from the army uh, that were protecting it because uh, that was on its way to, uh, to 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 America. So so they were saying on on the way to Texas, and they were saying, no, this is our water. We protect it. But what you're talking about is cross cross border cooperation. This idea that we're all in it together, and uh, you know that we all need to fight for the same the same cause. For me, it sounds more utopian than 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 a reality. And um, how do you think really we can we can actually get this down to the level of such as these farmers in Mexico to have an understanding that genuinely we are in it together? How how, how can that discourse be uh, be put forward? So, so thank you for the question, and, and I have a concrete answer as well because when at Ecopeace we completed uh, the research uh, proposing a renewable energy desalinated water exchange um you know hinterland in jordan uh, mediterranean coast israel palestine and the reaction that we got from all of our governments was well, why should we give up our own you know uh, uh, national assets why would we take the risk of being dependent on such a critical issue um, on a neighboring state, and, and not just any neighboring state, a neighboring state that we're, we've either been a, at war with in the past, um, uh, or there's still lots of underlying uh, hostility. Um, and and you know, when, when we initiated this uh, discussion you know, back in 2014 and 2015, um, that was the main response that we got from government, that uh, it's too risky. It's... It, 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 um, uh, it makes us uh, too uh, vulnerable uh, to uh, the instability of our neighboring state. Um, and it, it, can, it can place a level of control over us. Um, but as the climate crisis has continued to worsen in our region, and on the other hand, as commitments to reduce uh, emissions have increased, then our research has shown to our own governments that uh, uh, cooperation is uh, the most efficient and perhaps the most secure way to meet those commitments and to increase resilience. That, um, uh, and I, I'll give you uh, the example of, of uh, the government of Israel. Um, uh, as uh, the government of Israel's commitments to Paris increased, from 17% renewables um, uh, by 2030 to 30%, it became clear to decision makers that to reach that 30% commitment, uh, Israel struggles to find the land to build solar facilities. So looking at purchasing renewable energy from a neighboring state suddenly becomes not, a, not an issue to, to, to advance as a favor, but an issue of self-interest, because otherwise, I, I can't uh, uh, I can't meet my own commitment. And how more attractive that is, if through our research we show that purchasing that renewable energy through a neighboring state can actually be cheaper. So you can meet your commitments at even cheaper uh, uh, prices. And then the other the other uh, side of that coin um, is um, to create the healthy interdependencies, again, not as a favor, but as an understanding that you know, Jordan's uh, stability uh, is very much dependent on uh, water security. And uh, given the dramatic shortage of water that Jordan experiences, uh, 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 and given that Jordan you know, potentially can sell um, uh, electricity West, um, that encourages Jordan to feel more comfortable to be dependent on additional water imports from the Mediterranean, either from Israeli or in the future Palestinian sources. So there too, we see a change in mindset 
not because um, you know, suddenly you know, national security uh, is no longer important and sovereignty issues are no, are no longer important, but there's a, a, an advanced understanding that national security is very much interlinked with regional security and that regional insecurity, regional security will be strengthened through these types of, of measures of cooperation. So, so you know, we, we, we started with a why, why would we cooperate with conversations taking place at the highest levels in government over the need to cooperate, the self-interest of each side. And that's the game changer in, in political thinking. Yeah, no, fantastic. And also you talk about uh, these ideas of um, cross-sectoral approaches, really. Uh, not, not only the idea of the water sector looking after itself, but uh, interlinking between water, energy. Uh, and then we start to talk about the economics uh, with, uh, with regards to, to that. And I think uh, one of the other crucial points uh, here, and, and this is where I'll ask uh, you, Tanya, uh, to, to, to jump in. You, you mentioned the idea of science being, being critical. And I think that this is an, uh, an important uh, aspect where, where we see that science, of course, is advancing and we're having a better understanding of where we are with regards to, um, to climate and climate models and, and perhaps being even more accurate as we move forward. But uh, the science sector has notoriously been terrible at, uh, at communicating well uh, the, uh, the these effects to um, to the wider society. How do, how do you think uh, we can start to bring uh, the idea of uh, of what we're looking at and 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 this link between climate and conflict to uh, to to the broader society, specifically with uh, some of the scientific advances that we're seeing? Yeah, that that's a very important question. Um, and it, it's not an easy one uh, because the scientists are not trained to be communicators. <laughs> and I think that we should, <laughs> we should start doing something about it. Um, uh, so there needs to be a more, I would say, regular interaction between science and, and politics so that um, um, you know, the politicians would, would be able to understand um, what, what science is trying to tell them and also engage then uh, communicators that will translate that to the, to the public in a way that the public will accept the, the findings of science. Um, and it's not easy, but it, but it can be done. And uh, you have several initiatives, um, you know, that for example, popped up during the pandemic, uh, you know, um, by, by young scientists that, that, you know, aim to do exactly that, you know, to take science and try to translate it um, in, into something that the public and the politicians uh, can understand. And, and uh, we, we should definitely support, support this. Uh, and and it, why it's also, also very important to understand because you have, for example, now this, as you mentioned, this hype about climate change and conflict and all other impacts uh, it has on the economy, et cetera. And many times, you know, uh, investors would come into, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, country in um, um, less, uh, I would say, a developing country and, and would, would tell their leaders, you have a problem with climate change and here, we're here to help you. And th this leader, these leaders may, may not have any idea what, they, what you know, the investor is talking about, but they'll say, are you bringing money? Yeah, well, of course we have a climate problem. Um, so, you know, welcome. Um, but also speaking very, um, I mean, as this is, there's a direct connotation um, you know, like first in climate-induced hunger in Madagascar. Um, I'm, I'm very skeptical about these direct connotations because uh, this absolves governments of any responsibility. Um, so <laughs> I, I think um, this is something where, where we should be, uh, there definitely is a link as, as my as other speakers said, uh, that climate change is, is a threat multiplier and, and risk accelerator, but going into a direct link uh, to conflict, conflict is always a, a result of a, of a set of circumstances that, you know, that need to coincide in order to, to produce a conflict. But, but having said that, um, we have, if you look at climate change, how does it manifest itself? 
how, how does it reflect? Well, mostly, I would say 80-90% and the changes in the water cycle. So too much water, not enough water or polluted water. And we've, we, we've in, in the history, you know, you didn't see, um, a contrary to, to predictions, you didn't see um, conflicts over water. There was more cooperation, I would say, than conflict over water. But this may start to change. Um, and we've already are seeing conflict uh, in, in climate stressed areas in the Sahel, for example, between pastoralists and farmers. And, and all, this, this conflict can be very, very brutal and, and, and very bloody. Um, so, and, we, and there is also a possibility of, a, of conflict, uh, you know, among states, different states over water resources. I wouldn't put it beyond the impossible. Can I follow up one thing that Tanya said is that I think um, when we're thinking about the sort of linkages between conflict and climate, and I think this will speak to Guidon's points as well, um, the, it's not really a question of public awareness, right? So people are very well aware on the local level, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, of the impacts on their actual sort of the things that they do, right? Whether they access water, whether they're trying to grow a crop. But the question of what caused climate change is also the sort of political economy that generated, distributed, and extracts fossil fuels. And it's created these entrenched political and economic elites who are going to run out that uh, sort of system of economic um, uh, production until or unless, as Guidon said, you, you change the strategic calculus, right, of these decision makers. And I think that's what's really interesting about the way Ecopeace is framing these issues, right, as one of this actually benefits you. But I think there's a great deal of challenges there as well, because we really do have linkages between very powerful state-owned uh, oil and gas companies and foreign oil, oil and gas companies. And these are, of course, the way the drivers of climate change. So in a sense, we're asking the groups that are contributing to climate change in North America as well, of course, to actually get on board. And I think this is the challenge. It's not only communicating to the public, as I think Tanya so eloquently talked about, but it's really driving home to political decision makers that even though you have benefited from these, these sort of political economic systems, it is actually now time to really think about how can we all, but really how can they as well, benefit from transitions. And these transitions cannot just be an energy, right? I think we often talk about this transition as energy, but if we also introduce the environment again as a factor, then we really have to think about biodiversity loss, right? We can't just shift out of carbon, it's too late in that sense. So we really have to start thinking, how do we integrate climate change impacts across all these other kinds of environmental degradation? And then how do we communicate that to policymakers? So I think our challenges are multiple across sort of these political economic systems and also the sort of multiplicity of environmental challenges that are now both so closely linked to climate change. So, so I'd like to add, uh, jump in there as well and, and add further to the complexity um, because in the midst of conflict, our experience at Equipeace is that you need locals to raise their voices. That is not good enough to bring in foreign experts. You, you need to uh, work with uh, the locals from each of the respective communities. And um, you know, what, what our experience has so, showed is that you need uh, joint fact finding. Now, you, know, you, you need to bring in, in our case, we, we always try to bring together Palestinian, Jordanian, and Israeli experts to uh, uh, do the initial analysis together and to uh, come to an agreement as to what are the facts. Not that they need to espouse you know, those facts together, but it's critical that it's a Jordanian that speaks to the Jordanian public, a Palestinian to the Palestinian public, and an Israeli to the Israeli public as a means to, uh, uh, to build in um, a, a level of confidence in, in, in belief um, uh, in the facts, in the science that's presented. So, so you know, the, the level of inclusivity um, in order to meet the challenges that the climate crisis is presenting requires that, um, uh, uh, that, that really local scientists are, are empowered to raise their voices 
and 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 not only hear from sort of foreign international experts advising that it's far more effective when it's local experts uh, particularly in the midst of conflict that have that have done some common fact finding so that you know we come out with um, some shared uh, conclusions but not necessarily speaking in the same voice at the same time but in parallel uh, because that that, that parallel action um, uh, that that helps build uh, 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 synergies that advances political will. Um, so the science plays a critical role, but I think we, we often un misunderstand um, the importance of local science, of local scientists um, being at the forefront of speaking to the respective decision makers in each country. And I, I have to jump in here too. This is this is a very nice uh, sort of line of thought and conversation. And I think what Gideon just talks about is what Tanya said in her opening statement. She talked about agency. Uh, she said that uh, this is not uh, this is not deterministic. I mean, what what may be deterministic or determined are the increasingly precise projections that natural science provides us with. You know, we know with certainty now that certain sort of physical phenomena are, are already occurring and why they occur and that they are going to um, increase in the future. But when you, we don't have that position when it comes to the sort of social, political, economic implications of, of climate change. And I think that's what uh, Guidon is talking about. When we sort of translate this into um, those kinds of impacts, uh, this is where human agency counts. Uh, and I think that there's some uh, quite horrific numbers out there, very speculative in terms of how many people are going to be displaced and so on. And, and those numbers are based on assessments that sort of completely ignore that, that people not just, you know, it's, it's as if the world was static, that the only thing is going to change is, is the climate and population increase. And then people are just going to sit passively and sort of wait for this to happen and take no action. And it's exactly the kinds of, of um, uh, you know, and, and the ability to, to act, the, the, that there is the political space that the uh, people's rights are respected so that they can actually act on information and enter into agreements with others and so on. So I think this whole uh, social dimension of climate change, I think is, is sort of, uh, it, it's much less precise. There's much more room for human agency. And I think that's where we, we know that we can actually, and people will make a difference. So let's not, let's uh, again, questions question the, uh, you know, the hundreds of millions that are going to be displaced and so on. I simply don't believe that's uh, supported by evidence. Nice. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> we've actually, we've got a question from, uh, from, from the audience. And so I, I was looking at uh, my phone, not because my partner's writing to me, but I've got a number of questions from the, from the audience that uh, actually this, this one I, I like quite a lot because um, it starts to, uh, to bring it home a, a little bit. And it's, um, I wonder how true it is, though. But uh, maybe uh, Jenny, you can you can answer this one for for us. It's come from uh, Neil McCrea, and uh, and he asks, "Isn't it true that human beings' health suffers in conditions where there are elevated temperatures, particularly nighttime temperatures? Apparently, studies in the U.S. have shown that murder rates increase during heat waves. Won't global warming then have a direct impact on the level of conflict between and within nations?" I feel like I should give that to the person from the International Peace Research Institute. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll start with you being US and then we'll move over to Johan. So, so I will just say that I want to re-emphasize what Johan actually just said, right, which is I don't think uh, if you look at who suffers in a heat wave or who actually died in the basements in the recent floods in New York, it was not uh, sort of just a mass of people, right? It was people who were living in substandard housing who actually were in a place where they were already vulnerable. So I think it's, again, we're, we should be very suspicious of these sort of linear, if there's a heat wave, you know, more people are going to kill each other. I think that simply uh, ignores the social conditions in which you have crime, right? So crime doesn't result from heat waves. Crime results from a whole process of actual marginalization, criminalization, and, and of course, a, a sort of socialization as well. And in, in the US, violent crime is related to the lack of gun control. 
So it is actually a political choice made in the United States to have very high mass casualty rates from gun violence. And that is a purely political decision that's driven by internal sort of domestic contestation over who should have guns and what limits should be placed. So I just really want to emphasize Johan's point that these are political decisions. And that's what I was trying to say about we can't ignore who created climate change because it is the historical responsibility of Europe, the United States, and to a somewhat lesser extent, Russia and Japan for climate change. So the responsibility for action really has to deal with the interests that are still running the fossil fuel system. And until we really tackle that at home, and I mean in the industrialized countries, it's very hard for us to have any credibility, as you know, in calling for other forms of adaptation or mitigation. What, what is your view on this, Johan? Well, I, I share Jeannie's view, and I think most peace researchers would would do that as well. Um, and, and since I have the floor, let me just uh, say you you ask uh, Gideon about the you know isn't it utopian to to say what what Gideon was saying? I th I think we we thought the the coal and steel union in Europe was utopian. You had countries who had been fighting for for centuries against each other. But, but experience shows that, that this kind of process that Gideon is, is talking about is more uh, the human experience than the, the opposite, actually. And I think we have many cases, examples from Africa, from Europe and elsewhere, in terms of agreed sharing and management of particularly water resources, which is also possible in the Middle East. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that's a, that's a very good point, this idea that at least you start with the, with the idea and then you can work towards it. But if the idea is wrong, then, the, then you're not working, uh, working your, well, uh, your way well uh, within, that, uh, within that area. Uh, Tanya, I'd, come, I'd like to come to you from, uh, from Sil Slovenia's uh, point, uh, point of view. Do you th have you seen anything or do you believe that there's any uh, movement in this uh, direction uh, with climate change and, uh, and conflict? Um, is there anything that uh, from, from your side you believe that, uh, that yes, this is a, a, a deep concern for us or uh, do you think it is a bit more of a headline uh, notion? Um, no, I mean, there's definitely uh, a lot of discussion on, on this topic within the EU, within NATO, in the UN Security Council. Um, so, and, and I'm, I'm happy, you know, uh, that this is the case, but uh, of course, at the same time, everything we've said so far, we should be ca careful not to imply any direct correlations, but always to contextualize um, uh, specific situations. Um, but what I would like to to come back to to, um, to what Gideon was saying because I I served, most of my career are dedicated to the Middle East and I served in, in Israel and Palestine also um, and um, you know you, you you said it was it, it, what what Gideon said might, might be a utopian if you look at the political um, part of of the situation. Um, you may be pessimistic, and this looks maybe utopian, um, but exactly because the climate change can be an entry point, um, I think this is not utopian. And I think exactly this is the way to maybe um, start, you know, building confidence. I think the Gideon's project, Ecopeace project, is 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 uh, presents a fantastic opportunity. To actually, um, you know, tackle a, a crisis which needs to be tackled. It's not something you, we can leave for ten years later. It needs to be dealt with now. Water scarcity needs to be dealt with now. Um, reducing emissions needs to be dealt with now. So I think this is a very good uh, way to, you know, start to work together to enter co uh, codependencies and and through this build confidence for other forms of cooperation in other fields. And we've seen this in my neighborhood, you know, after the bloody war in, 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 in the Balkans, uh, the first regional agreement that was concluded after the Dayton agreement was on the Sava River Basin. So water cooperation was the first cooperation to be started in, in the region among former warring parties. And out of that, because it was successful slowly, they begin to build up other forms of cooperation. 
So this is what also encouraged Slovenia to say, okay, there's something in this story, let's pursue this further and engage in water, water diplomacy, transboundary water cooperation. Because we've seen firsthand that this works, that this can, be, this can really work. I'd like to expand on those uh, important words of Tanya, again, with um, uh, uh, real life uh, comments uh, that have been made uh, by government officials in Israel and Palestine. And when we look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, uh, since the signing of the Oslo Accords between Israel and the PLO, the approach taken was either we agree on all outstanding issues, um, and for those that are not familiar with the issues, you know, Jerusalem, ref Palestinian refugees, settlements, um, uh, borders, all really complicated issues. And amongst uh, those issues was, was also water, um, uh, resolving water issues between Israelis and Palestinians. And for 27 years, you know, the approach taken by both governments and the international community has been um, you know, with a sense of logic that we need to you know, strike a deal, that all issues need to be resolved at once. And once those issues are resolved, we have peace. Well, for 27 years, that hasn't happened. We haven't been able to resolve all of these issues. And in one, in some ways, the climate crisis can be uh, seen as helping the governments come down from the trees, from this high position that um, no, you know, there's no compromise until everything is achieved. Um, you know, we want to see end of conflict on all issues. And, uh, you know, the climate, the climate crisis, um, uh, because of its uh, heavy impact, uh, on uh, resilience and water issues and livelihood as a result of, uh, of water issues um, uh, presents a new level of necessity that um, perhaps uh, uh, what we're seeing uh, is enabling government officials in both Israel and Palestine for the very first time to, to question, well, you know, m maybe we don't have to. You know, the, the, the seriousness of the issue that we're facing on climate um, uh, uh, results in a, a need to move forward on the water issue. And, and you know, I, I would have argued that the water issue should always have moved forward because it was the most solvable and it improves the situation on the ground. But the fact that, the, that we're seeing politicians um, adopt the narrative of the climate crisis as another as, as the urgent reason, a region, a reason for moving forward on this issue is welcomed. If, if we can help you know, politicians um, uh, uh, you know, express um, uh, their political interests in a little bit of a different way through the climate crisis, as long as we're still you know, improving the situation on the ground and advancing the two-state solution, then, then we're moving forward in the right direction. And, and uh, I, I think that that's the, uh, uh, the opportunity um, that, that the climate crisis, as, as Tanya just said, presents. It's another entry point that's not traditional. It's out of the box and enables your know, politicians to still be you know, so black and white on, on their broader view, but, but to come and say, but now there's an urgency and we're not changing were responding to a new reality, a, a new reality that they should have responded to anyway, but, but nevertheless, the fact that they're willing to think out of the box today is nevertheless uh, very much welcome. Can I, can I just add something, which is that um, I think is a tendency to talk about conflict in the region and then go to Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. And so I just want to remind us that I think this discussion is also useful for maybe thinking about both why we haven't had more transboundary cooperation on major things like the usage of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers or the Nile rivers, right? Where, where basically conflict is still local conflict and regional conflict is really driving over extraction on, on the rivers. And of course, um, creating very, very dire downstream impacts in countries like Iraq. So I think what we also have to remember is that different states are differently positioned for their incentives for cooperation. So you can see that actually for Israel and Palestine, both relatively small, right? Uh, but with completely different economies, there's a different structure for incentives. Um, I think when we look at places like Turkey, Iran, and Iraq, 
we're starting, we, we see that the internal problems that Johan and I were talking about earlier, where really environmental activism and concern about local impacts is really not part of the conversation and is securitized such that if you are an environmental activist, you are often accused of basically being against the state. And I think we really have to take seriously those uh, state society relationships that hinder the kinds of opportunities that both Tanya and uh, I think Gidon were so eloquently expressing. Um, I'm quite much more pessimistic ab about the ability of us to proactively deal with these situations. I think in some ways uh, it will be when the aquifers keep depleting so rapidly that people actually don't have access to water. And when we have the sort of the rivers running dry so much of the year that we are forced into acknowledging these. And I wish I could say we were at that tipping point and I don't necessarily see it yet. We have uh, five minutes left of this uh, of this session. So uh, and and this there are some other questions that have come that have come in and 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 I have a feeling uh, we could sit here all day. I think we, the only thing that we're missing is a couple of beers and and we could uh, we could spend the rest of the afternoon here, right? Um, but I think uh, in in probably the interest of of time, if we can uh, go into some uh, sort of closing uh, closing words, closing remarks from uh, from each of you, just to for what you've heard, uh, what what you've uh, what, what you've uncovered from uh, from today with the other discussions, uh, uh, how how do you see us moving forward uh, together collectively? And I'll start with you first, uh, Tanya. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the main takeaways, and I think we probably all agreed on on pretty much everything. Um, um, is, is on the need of uh, localized, uh, to, to put the emphasis on, on, on local solutions. I mean, to work closely, not to, especially for someone like EU. It, our, our cooperation should always be demand driven. Uh, so we should understand what, what because even when it when it comes to climate change, it it affect the local the, the effects on the local level are very specific and affect each community differently. And we should always go to the local community and 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 talk to them and devise these solutions together. Um, and when it comes to transboundary issues, uh, as uh, as Gideon said, joint analysis. You know, joint um, uh, brings joint solutions, uh, joint understanding, and then joint solutions, and build, this builds confidence. Um, so uh, this is this is something that I think is is uh, extremely extremely important. And the climate change as an entry point uh, for for many issues um, is is uh, is I think is is an opportunity we shouldn't miss. Thank you. And and over to you, Johan, uh, just some uh, closing closing thoughts from your side. Um, well, again, yes, we've agreed on many things. The only thing I would add that we haven't so much talked about is that most of the phenomena that we're now talking about, including displacement, are internal. They happen within the borders of nations. There were 30 million people displaced by natural disasters last year. Almost all of them were within the borders of the country and, and most of them were because of floods and storms and, and short term and people had to return and I think this displacement has to be uh, understood as uh, a part of the adaptation uh, measures that uh, countries are needed need to take sometimes uh, displacement or, or mobility will actually be the most uh, uh, logical and sound uh, adaptation measure and this needs to be recognized it, it is not and I think we should avoid talking about climate refugees and so on because this is not uh, this is not uh, you know uh, uh, the reality at this stage Thank you, Jan. And uh, Gidan, uh, your final reflections. So, so I, I, um, I'm concerned that the way that we're tackling the climate crisis doesn't help us advance the type of solutions needed. You know, the the main way that you're through the UN system and that we're tackling a, a climate crisis is through national commitments. Um, we're not searching for regional solutions we're not we're not approaching 
the climate crisis and its related security issues from the particular regional uh, impact of the crisis itself. And, and therefore, I think we're missing a whole you know, set of opportunities um, that, that uh, would do us well to uh, uh, counter both you know, advanced uh, you know, uh, climate uh, mitigation, but, but even more importantly, um, uh, to advance climate adaptation and resilience. So I, I'm, I hope that um, you know, as we you know, post uh, Glasgow and, and, and as uh, we go into uh, Sharm and, uh, and uh, uh, the UAE as, as the, as the uh, next uh, locations where, where discussions will take place, that there'll be a, a movement, a, a greater understanding and perhaps a, a call. I mean, that's, that's what we're learning from the ground. That, that it's not enough to be speaking at a national level. Um, we need to be uh, uh, networking and thinking out of the box at a regional level. But the climate negotiations don't support that, don't help that, don't facilitate that. And I, I guess that's a call to some of the national governments that, uh, that are here and that, that, that perhaps are listening uh, as a means to improve uh, uh, the discussion, you know, rather than uh, taking things directly just to the Security Council, which I totally support. I think that you know the climate and security issues need to be discussed at the Security Council, but I don't think that's sufficient. I, I think that our whole understanding of the climate crisis and how to respond to it um, uh, needs to be not only uh, you know focused from a national. Uh, perspective, but but be, to be balanced and look at a regional perspective, because that's where the impacts are, and 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 from those impacts, we'll be able to better draw on the solutions. Fantastic, thank you, yeah, Gideon and uh, Jeannie. Just your final remarks. We're already a, a little bit over time, but uh, just your <laughs> your final reflections. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And so Gidon went from the national level to the regional level, and I totally agree with that. I'm going to also argue that we should be thinking from the national level down. So the most effective climate action in the U.S. because of our system has been at at actually municipal scales and state scales, right? So when California does something, the rest of the nation is kind of pulled along. And I think we need to think about that in the context of the Middle East and North Africa. So uh, we've been talking about sort of integrating regional infrastructures, which is, is Guidon's plan. It actually integrates an electrical infrastructure to facilitate the exchange of, of water and energy. But importantly, is also thinking about what is happening at the subnational level to actually increase resilience and decrease dependence on just one single national infrastructure. So Guidon EcoPeace also did a project in Gaza where they installed uh, uh, re um, uh, renewable energy solar panels and where they work on um, basically treating sewage water. And I think those initiatives are just as important because they increase local uh, sort of adaptive capacities and resilience. And I, I think that speaks to Johan's point about mobility right political the obstacles to mo to mobile populations and people relocating are their political so why can't you leave Gaza is a political question not a sort of anything else so I think we really need to think about what are the local obstacles to adaptation and how do those connect to political questions uh, that have much broader ramifications Thank you very much uh, Jeannie I think you've uh, summed, summed that up quite quite nicely and uh, and it brings it right back to what uh, Tanya was saying uh, at the start, the idea of uh, needing local solutions uh, to to solve these uh, these problems, and was what uh, Gideon was saying uh, before the the idea of uh, getting these local voices uh, out there, uh, making sure that uh, that those are those are heard, and 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 uh, indeed what you were mentioning uh, goes in line with uh, with what Johan was also uh, saying, the the idea of sound adaptations. Uh, that are that are required from, uh, from from that local that local side. So it seems that we need a mix of local, national, regional, and then regional, national, local, right? Uh, bringing it all uh, all together in in that sense. So with that, I'd, I'd uh, like to thank uh, all of you so much for uh, for joining uh, today. Like I said, a couple of beers, and we would have been here all night. But uh, thank you uh, so much for uh, for your time and your insights and uh, and you can see that uh, climate change is in good hands when when we speak to uh, people like yourself so uh, thank you to all of you and, and back to the uh, the the hosts
Thank you.